Good morning and welcome to our work webinar this morning. It's bright and early on the West Coast here and uh, uh, great to see everybody joining our call this morning. Look forward to the interactive conversation with Diane and myself. Um, and so thank you for everyone for, for joining us today. To get the session started, we'd really like to run a quick poll that'll provide us an overview of how you've rated your past for structuring success. And this is going to help us focus our discussion today. So if we can have the first poll come up, how would you rate your organization's restructuring projects in the past year? They were very good, they were okay, but there were some areas of improvement, or was it a complete disaster? So select one option and let's see what everyone's thoughts were over the last year. This is great. I see about 70% of people have voted. Fantastic. Okay, so it looks like the majority of people felt um, they did an okay job, but there were some areas of improvement. And this is going to be helpful as we kind of talk through our, our discussion this morning. So really to leverage that comment, I'd like to share with you initially um, really an example of where collateral damage from a restructuring uh, really can wear many faces. And it's often not immediately visible. And it can really happen to the best of organizations. So we worked with a, a financial services organization who was planning an approximate 150 person restructuring. And they had a very well seasoned HR business partner team and had uh, managers that had uh, gone through this many times before. And they really felt they were confident in, uh, in the prior experience they had. So on the surface, it really seemed fairly calm. But within a few days, we started to get repeated calls from human resources as they started experiencing some unexpected fallout that really fell into three areas. So firstly, on the logistics side, um, they identified issues with inconsistency in manager messaging to departing employees and to the remaining employees. And this really linked back to their decision not to do a refresh of the manager notification training as they felt uh, the team was experienced enough. A larger issue really resolved around having the right people on the project team as they were really unaware that their own talent acquisition colleagues were actively hiring for a new service that was being launched. And some of these employees uh, that were being exited may have been able to be redeployed or reskilled or, or upskilled for some of those areas. And then the third area really involved around a growing loss of trust that was primarily driven due to lack of communication. So this again can be linked back to some of the logistics planning as it would have been reviewed in the manager training. And then several remaining employees felt cut off as uh, some of their managers had already been pre-scheduled for a two-day offsite that same week. And so in effect, they did vanish. And so rumors started. And then the icing on the cake was about a month later, human resources came back to us and uh, told us that two high potential employees had also exited the organization. And during their exit interview, what they shared with us was it was really um, because of a lack of managerial communication, of trust, and they really didn't feel that the culture was a good fit for them anymore. So when we take a look at that story, let's take um, a, a kind of a deeper dive at some of the key risks and impact. And so the first area that I really want to talk about is, you know, how do you, uh, how do organizations plan for contingencies, minimize, you know, the cost and uh, the post restructuring can cause. And so LHH has really looked at these, um, I guess, five areas of collateral damage that I want to talk about with you. The first one is a high drop in employee engagement in morale. So disengagement um, really can have different side effects. One manufacturing plant that we worked with saw more safety issues due to a lack of morale. In the, in the story I just shared, uh, a lack of communication from both the organization and the managers created some uh, rumors that were being fueled and disengagement and morale declined. 
And so in the second area that we've identified, this is really taking a look at uh, moderately high risk that can happen with productivity lost. So what I'm going to really say and share with you is that you must allow time for remaining employees to adjust and to grieve. They will experience similar emotions as departing employees. And sometimes the added guilt um, that they weren't chosen, that they've survived is added on top of that. So uh, an insurance organization that we've worked with comes to mind and they had made significant changes to their independent broker agreements and problems with the planning and the rollout actually resulted in a double digit decline in sales in that same quarter because of that. The third area, which has moderately high risk, is on the employer brand and the damage that can be caused. So you don't want to um, erode the trust or have that impact your brand. You know, how you treat departing employees will impact both the uh, employee retention and the future employee attraction. So you need to demonstrate the commitment to both departing and remaining employees and wherever possible, be as transparent as you can. Um, what I work with organizations and help train their managers, they hear me repeatedly talk about the need for transparency and the, the need for hyper communication. This is really critical. And the fourth area that we've identified is really having that moderately high risk area of the restructuring not fully meeting of the goals that were intended. So when we talk about the goals not being met, remember this is more than just the cost savings, but will the restructuring meet the overall goals to help the organization move forward? Uh, we've seen organizations move away from their goals the closer they get to the notification date Managers start to become very protective of their employees. And for the wrong reasons, sometimes names get taken off the list. And what this often happens is it results in another restructuring wave having to take place six or nine months later. So this is eroding further trust within the organization. So be clear with your goals. Why are you doing this? And help the employees understand the goals and where you're going. So presenting that strong business rationale will garner more employee trust. And so really the fifth area is uh, having a moderate risk area in talking about negative lever sentiments. And, and what I mean by this is really your former employees. They have strong voices. So in the story I shared, the financial institution lost two high potentials and these became part of the total employees that were part of the restructuring in effect, that they didn't want to lose, their numbers increased. So you want to reduce the negative lever sentiments that are going to impact your remaining employee morale, the productivity, your brand, and the products um, that they're buying. So if you are a financial institution, you don't want them switching lenders or banks. Or if you're in the telecom, you don't want them switching internet providers. You don't want them to have such a negative leaving sentiment that that impacts the brand and potentially the products that they're also um, purchasing. Kim, are there any other examples or advice that you want to, uh, to add to this? Uh, thanks, Diane. And I think it's an interesting conversation. And I always go back to the 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 trials and tribulations of having social media so much of this gets blasted on the on the internet and social media mediums out there if things aren't handled well so i'm sure everybody has examples around even employees remaining in the organization uh, have the power to impact that organization whether we like it or not whether it's through facebook or twitter or whatever they happen to use so it is interesting to see the power of an individual employee now has way more impact on how yes. successful this is perceived or not. So uh, very good examples that you shared, Diane. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Great. So with those uh, kind of things in, in mind and reflecting on those maybe five potential areas of collateral damage, we'd like to hear from you again. And we're going to put up a second poll. And it's really talking about which of those five areas has your organization been faced with in the past? 
So has there been a productivity loss? Has there been a drop in morale and engagement? Um, do you experience negative lever sentiment, damage to your brand, or again, the goals not being met? So we'll give that a few seconds just for you to um, answer as many as appropriate that are on that list. I see around 50% have voted. We'll wait for a few more. This is awesome. Perfect. Okay, so it looks like the top one is really that drop in employee engagement morale, which is not um, a surprise because that is really the highest impact and risk that we have also identified. And it's closely followed by loss in productivity and the restructuring goals not being met. Okay, this is, this is very good. So this is gonna um, help feed up conversation. I'm gonna ask Kim really now to walk us through um, uh, how a business restructuring approach can be really applied to your restructurings. Thanks, Diane. And it's interesting, we should take a little bit of a step back because the impact of a restructuring begins long before the actual restructuring happens. And we've seen a significant increase in the collateral damage from the organizations we've heard from, seen, all of us have seen it in the media around how people have of managed some of those uh, activities, but it begins long before. So what we thought would be helpful is to kind of walk through what is kind of the business restructuring approach, not just the actual event. As I said, all of those things that happen long before the restructuring are critical in making sure they have success. So at the beginning of it, it's really around what is that business strategy you're trying to achieve right now? And what is the goal of the outcome of that restructuring? So when you look at the business strategy, really you're looking to say, what are you, where are you trying to take your organization and what's gonna help you get there? And often, and I'll use the example, Example, what we're seeing right now is many organizations are focused on a digital transformation. We've seen financial institutions focus on that. We've seen insurance focus on that. We've seen consumer packaged goods focus on that. So all of this big uh, digital transformation is more about than just the restructuring. It's saying, what's the business strategy we need for growth and how are we going to get there? And so this is key to keep this step one around what is the goal in me with the goal in mind for the end. What are you trying to achieve? And so that's really important that everybody understands that and gets communicated that. The next is really the big piece where the heavy lifting starts with HR is around what is the organizational structure you need for the future? What is the workforce you need for the future? How do you prepare the workforce for the, for the future? That is really key to understand what are those roles you need for the future? And what I mean by that is often we focus on Let's eliminate these roles and therefore we move forward. Often it's saying, okay, we're eliminating these roles, but what are the new roles that some of these people might be able to fit into? So looking at what is that future fit of your workforce long before you get to your actual restructuring event. And then looking at your talent, doing, conducting a talent review. This requires more than HR. This is a highly collaborative, complex process where you need your leaders involved. What is the talent we need for the future? What are the roles we're going to need for the future? And how do we select who is best going to fit? So if we think about it in the context of segmenting our staff, who is future fit now? Who might need a little bit of upskilling to get them ready for the future? And who might need some reskilling to kind of transform completely? And who are the people that have the aspirational goals to go with you? Who has the attributes? Who has the agility to go with you? So that is where a lot of that heavy lifting begins long before an actual restructuring event. Really critical that we get all of the HR community involved. Often what happens is we have employee relations working in isolation, separate from the talent development team that's evaluating the skills gap, separate from the roles that talent acquisition is trying to fill. It's kind of looking at your all of your staff population and roles and evaluating what you need for the future. The next is looking at the stakeholder engagement. As all of us in HR, and I'm suspecting many HR professionals on the call today, we all understand the change curve. So at some point you need to bring your leaders into the fold around where are we taking the business and how are we gonna get there? We need to enable the leaders to support the employee population and create that buy-in. So what is that future vision and how are we going to get there? 
enabling those leaders to have those interesting conversations with the team and be able to enable that goal for the future. The fifth is really around the communication and training. And I can't say enough, communication is key to the success or failure of any restructuring. And when we're going through a period of change, people often go inwardly focused. Oh my God, what's gonna to happen to me? What's gonna to happen to my job? They don't often hear the messages. So all I can say is communicate, communicate and communicate more because that's gonna be critical. But what does that communication mean and, and to whom? And part of this is, is preparing your leaders and managers to enable the employee population. But part of it is around getting your managers to have career coaching conversations with their employee population to say, who has the aspiration for some of the new roles we have? Who has goals to grow in the organization? Who really doesn't want to do any changing? And if that role is being eliminated, maybe they're, they'll be leaving the organization. So really setting the organization for, up for success is really training the, the managers to have the conversation. And then second part of training is actually preparing them for all the notification for, that are going to happen with your restructuring. So as Diane mentioned, is part of this is getting them trained up and having consistent messages around what the notification is and why it's happening. Again, consistent messaging and ensuring you're treating people with dignity is so critical because everybody internally will be watching to see how that ha is handled. Whoops, sorry, skipped ahead on you. Is redeployment is something that I, is really looking at alternatives to elimination of roles. And what I mean by that is we often focus again on elimination of roles versus looking who might be ready for the future fit. But there's two ways to look at this. One is saying, if we give people the opportunity to look for alternative roles, so say 30, 60, 90 days before their job's eliminated, you create huge goodwill with your employee population to say, okay, Diane, I'm gonna give you 60 days to see if you can find another role in the organization do all the hunting and looking yourself. And if you find something great, if not, unfortunately, your job's going to be eliminated. So giving them alternative. The second is if you're large enough, global, multiple locations, think of it in the context of career development. Maybe somebody wants the opportunity to go overseas. Maybe somebody wants the opportunity to move to Western Canada. Look at alternatives where you can actually redeploy internally your talent. If you think about the cost savings there, you have less severance costs, you re retain some of your key talent, you retain some key institutional knowledge that isn't going out the door. So there's so many benefits if you focus on finding ways to keep key talent versus purely elimination. So I'd, I challenge you all to think about who could be redeployed within your organization into different roles. Actually, before I go to step seven, one of the examples I, I was just going to put out there, um, and, it, and it's a well-known example, so I can speak to it. Uh, Walt Disney Company was actually going through a major restructuring, and they were eliminating a whole customer service group within their organization. And that customer service group was primarily women and primarily over the age of 50. And they said, we've got to figure out how we're going to keep this institutional knowledge. What they ended up doing is putting them through an intensive uh, um, coding course, I think it was like a six month intensive course for probably 30 women. Basically, they consolidated, they assessed their talent, they put them through this program and ended up putting them back into the technology division of their organization. And what ended up happening is two things. One, they were surprised at them how much institutional knowledge allowed them to ramp up quickly. And within a year, they were equivalent to a three to five year a coder within the organization that they already had. What they realized is the value of that institutional knowledge creates some huge value that was going out the door. It also created goodwill with the organization that they found ways to redeploy people. Um, and it found great ways that they actually considered reskilling these people to find a new opportunity. So I'm giving you a bigger scale of what people can do, but you could look at one or two positions saying, let's look at this one or two positions and what can we do? Um, to upskill them or reskill them for a new role. Step seven is the actual notification day. And this is where everybody's got the eyes on the organization and how things are being handled and how people are being treated. At the end of the day, we should be treating people as well when they exit the organization as when they join the organization. So all hands on deck, setting up a centralized hub, 
to make sure all of the HR community and your support team is aware of what's going on to make sure it's the best possible smooth execution of that very, very difficult day. Post notification. Well, at the end of the day, what happens post notification, as many HR people will know, that's where lots more heavy lifting begins as people have questions, potential litigation. How you handled steps one through seven will totally impact the, the degree in which litigation uh, that you need to mitigate and any risk that you have. So how you prepped all those first seven steps will be critical post notification and how, organize, how the organization sees what's happening. So that'll be critical for you as an organization. Diane, anything you'd like to add to that? I, I think really just to talk about step eight again, I, I agree with you. I think it can't be mentioned enough, the importance of post planning. Um, I, I relate this sometimes to a common analogy where people will say all the attention to planning is put on the wedding and not the marriage or the birth and not the parenthood. And I would also add in restructurings, many organizations do extensive planning leading up to the announcement day and not enough planning on what happens after you cross that finish line. What happens to the remaining employees? Um, we worked with an organization last year that set up a dedicated change management team for the remaining workforce. So that's putting equal emphasis on the departing employees and the remaining employees. It was, it was fantastic how they rolled that out. Great, thanks, Diane. So let's take a look about the people equation. At the end of the day, all of this is about people. That's the people staying, that's the people leaving. And everybody needs different levels of support to get through it. At-risk employees is referencing those that are potentially losing their job. At the end of the day, these people need to feel supported. They need to know that the organization is doing something to support them. And for those that are leaving, obviously, career transition support would be one thing that we would recommend. Um, it helps them focus on the future, not looking back. Why me versus Bob? We really want them focused on looking forward. But at the end of the day, that support needs to focus on Instead of what's being done to me, what are the things I can control? My mindset I can control, how I manage my career I can control, to putting things in place to support those that are potentially losing. If those are people that you might consider redeploying, what is it that that can look like to help them reskill or upskill? The remaining employees, again, the quicker we can get them to bounce back after that restructuring initiative, what are those things we can be doing to help build some resiliency with them? I often think of it as the learning mindset or the growth mindset. How do we get them thinking differently around that continuous learning? So they're focused on moving through it versus resisting it. You're always going to have resistors to every restructuring because it's something that they're not controlling. How do you create some buy-in around that? And as Diane mentioned, any change in initiatives will definitely support that. Any support around emotional resiliency is definitely an important part to think about. Managing and le managers and leaders, at the end of the day, these are the people that are frontline facing to every employee. They need, need to be ready to deal with those changes. They need to buy into those changes. So we need to enable the leaders to have that support, getting leader support around change and support, making sure they're ready to have that conversation with their employees, being visible to the organization, to their teams, not hiding in an office. In this case is everything's virtual, so it's a little bit different. Um, but how do they make sure they're visible and make sure they're supporting their employees in terms of moving forward, having the conversations about the future? What does that mean to me? What does it mean to our department? Again, everybody often goes internally focused to say, what does that mean to me? Having the conversation around the future. People are more likely to move forward when they can see the vision, they can see the future. So focusing on what you can do to help the individuals move forward on that. And then human resources. This is what I really call the kind of the new talent ecosystem that really needs to work hard together because it doesn't always happen. This is looking at how does employee relations that are actually planning the restructuring work with talent acquisition that's actually filling roles that then also works with learning and development that's already identifying skills gap for the future. Those three groups need to be intertwined as they move through this project. Often organizations' best practices is setting up a workforce transformation team that includes people from those multiple departments. So making sure as HR has to do the heavy lifting, these, te these teams are working in kind and in, in together to have a, a strong outcome. Often I find people don't realize some of the roles that talent acquisition might be hiring for 
well, the employee relations team is actually letting people go. And I often hear from people, well, how come they let go all these people when they've got 100 open positions? Again, you think about the future fit. They're hiring for the future. They're not hiring for the past organization. And so often those groups really need to spend time working together and kind of creating that ecosystem to have support to create the mindset for the future for the organization. And finally, the organization. What does the organization need to be doing to help people move forward? They need to over communicate the vision and the strategy. We're doing this to get to our end goal. We're doing this to help us grow our business. We're doing this to refocus our organization on our key uh, components of our business. Why are we doing it and what, what's gonna get us there? And so those are really key components that we need to look at as we plan any restructuring. Any other things you'd like to add to that, Diane? No, I think that's great, Kim. Thank you. Well, let's segue into another poll and see what you have to say and see what you think your organization can approve upon. So let's move on to this next poll. And there's lots of words on this page. So we're gonna give you a few extra moments to think about what this means and check off as many as possible that you think that your organization could get better at. This is great. I see around 60% have voted. We'll wait for great. a few councils. Thank you, Samara. Wow, that's interesting. So it's pretty split evenly, except for the change and resiliency piece seems to have a huge, a bigger emphasis. And I think sometimes uh, for any of the HR folks on the community, we know if you think about a marathon, the people at the front of the marathon are gonna be buying into it way sooner than the people at the back end or the last ones to be aware of it. So that is often overlooked and it's great to see there's some areas uh, that people need to improve her on. So it's really interesting to see how split. Now seek external career support for departing employees seems to be something that most of this group seems to find their organizations do well, which is always great to see. Very interesting to see how that breaks out pretty evenly. Very good. Now I'd like to turn it back over to uh, Diane and she's gonna walk you through some, uh, a bit of a checklist around when you're planning some of these restructuring things to start thinking about. And then we're gonna open it up to uh, a Q&A. So over to you, Diane. Perfect, thank you, Kim. So we've really talked about a lot of these, um, these boxes here before, and there's just a couple I wanna maybe put a little more emphasis and discussion on. When we, when we talk about that balanced team, uh, you heard Kim talk about, you know, in the, in the business strategy, it's really important to have that balanced project planning team so you know what's going on in all aspects of your organization. Because um, we we can find in some organizations, the decisions are made in a, in a smaller team. It's sometimes done for confidentiality, but it's in isolation without enough knowledge of the critical employee roles. So hence, there's not a holistic end-to-end -end separation approach to the organization. And they have not considered alternatives to redundancy, whether that's redeployment, reskilling, or upskilling. The other area I would also like to maybe just spend uh, another minute talking about is the box on the, the bottom right. And this is really, you know, additional pandemic or virtual considerations. So I'd like to share some, um, uh, some, some best practices that we've experienced during the pandemic, having now supported, you know, uh, over thousands of virtual notifications. We've really learned uh, there's been two key areas that have really come up. One is more obvious than the other. And so the first one is technology. So not a surprise, um, most organizations best practice is really to have notifications done where possible in person. So a physical type of setup. But in the current situations, that's not uh, feasible for most organizations. So with the technology, you really have to put all your plan B contingencies in place 
what happens if there's connectivity failures, if there's audio or microphone issues? What are you going to do if the employee intentionally disconnects from your call? What are all your plan B's related technology? The other element that we've talked to many organizations about is also, um, you know, you don't know if your employees are recording conversations. So going back to one of my initial comments about having consistent manager training so that the scripting and the messaging is the same is very important. And the other area that became very visible over the last year um, is a little more, I'll say, one of those invisible collateral damage issues. And that really focused on the employee's personal privacy in their home environment. So in in a face-to-face situation, after someone's received the uh, notification news that they're they're losing their, their position, the employee has some time to absorb the news between the time they're leaving the organization, um, going back to their home, waiting for family to either get home from work or school. And there's that, that group of time where they have time to absorb, decompress, and start thinking about how am I going to tell my family? And so one of the biggest, um, I, I would say, considerations and risks that we have now faced is with COVID, that personal reflection time and, and that privacy has been stripped away. So employees in a lot of uh, situations do not have the luxury of a private home office. They're sharing a table with family um, or they don't have headphones. And so the conversation is even more open. So there are household distractions. There are interruptions. So that personal time to absorb and digest that news has vanished during COVID. And so this has dominoed, we have seen, to a, a different level of mental health issues. And so um, depending on where you are in the country and that, you know, the stay at home or the lockdowns, the whole personal privacy with people hearing the news has been probably one of the most significant changes that we've experienced. So I think it's important when you take a look at all of these different areas um, to really plan through what your plan B's are. Do you have to think about local considerations? And this is geography that I'm talking about here. Are there things you need to be mindful of? Are you in a very more small or rural area where your organization's restructuring? And making sure that you've got all of the plans and the logistics in place really to launch a, a successful restructuring as much as possible to avoid that collateral damage. So Kim, I think um, I'll pass it back to you because I think it's a great opportunity for us now to, to see what kind of questions uh, everyone has. Great. Thanks, Diane. So there's lots of uh, best practices listed on this uh, page that you see right now. I'd like to open it up to the Q&A in terms of questions people might have on any of the, the slides that we covered today or any of the topics, but also if there's something that's uh, on your mind with regards to restructuring events or workforce transformation initiatives that you'd like us to to comment on. So I'll open it up to the group um, and see what questions uh, that we can hear from everybody today. So if you go to the Q&A function on your screen, there's a, you can start typing in questions there and we can address those questions. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and and, and we'll open up the floor to that. So Kim, it looks like one here has to do with um, a little more information on redeployment and how organizations can leverage that as they're planning their restructuring. Great, so thanks think, Diane. Yeah. Do you want me to cover that? Sure, yeah. I'll take that one on. So uh, everybody has different language or, or words that they use to describe redeployment. So that's rather they're redeploying them into a different role, that's reskilling them into another role or upskilling them. But it's really thinking about how do you move your workforce around and keep them versus always letting them go? And, and I kind of talk about it in the context of the hiring firing cycle. Some organizations I see get in this cycle where they're continuously firing a big amount of people every year and bringing on new talent as if new talent is the best talent versus actually looking at their talent. So one of the things that I find with organizations, if they put an initiative in place is really looking at top performers that their position might be eliminated, but might fit elsewhere in the organization. So really evaluating the skills for the future and aspirational goals of individuals to look at that going forward. But it's really looking at, and you don't need to say, take everybody in an organization. You could be a 300 person organization or you could be a 5,000 
size organization to consider that as a strategy and a cost effective way to manage your workforce. That's great. So here, let's take a look at some of these other questions online. Mm -hmm. um, where we've announced a major site closure taking place in 2025. What are your, some of your best practices you'd recommend to keep employees engaged, retained over the long period of time? Great question. And one of the things that I would, I'll take that one on, Diane, sure. is uh, we see this happening a lot in organizations. And, and one of the things you think about is that's a long time away. So some of it is retaining your talent is going to be key and keeping them engaged for sure. And part of retention is actually understanding them what are their options. And so the biggest areas that an individual can control that the organization can enable is their career development. What are the things you can be doing to develop them between now and 2025? What are the key skills that they could be building? How could they be building their network opportunities to find another opportunity? And I don't know if you have other locations in your organization, but where's there other places that they could potentially get involved in? What are the skills that they could develop? And then the next part is around uh, the mindset, the continuous learning mindset and trying to develop that. So offering opportunities for development for people between now and 2025, part of that might be retention bonuses closer to the time for critical roles. But one of the things that we've seen a lot of organization is setting up some kind of hub or portal that they can access at any time to find information on career development, find information of, of what's in demand in their particular occupation. I'm going to say that they're an engineer. What are the changing skill sets needed for engineers in the future? What are the, some of the developments they could be doing? So I would say career development is going to be key. Uh, letting them you know they're supporting them between now and then letting them know what you're actually going to do to support them in terms of financial at the point in which you close down, letting them know if there's opp opportunities to move elsewhere in the organization. Yeah, that's great. We have another question here, which is asking about recommendations on uh, with the fact that people are now at home with little privacy or little downtime to do other activities. Um, you know, are there ways to schedule termination meetings differently? Or, you know, can the company do things to help them maintain their dignity, dignity as much as possible? So if I reflect back to last year, um, there absolutely was a, a little bit of, of time in between where organizations were just trying to figure out how to manage their business, let alone uh, really look at, do I need to now restructure a part of my workforce? We quickly saw, probably within about two months, organizations were quickly um, figuring out how to, um, how to recruit, how to hire, how to negotiate, how to onboard, how to train virtually. They figured out it, it very quickly because a lot of organizations, depending on what industry you were in, some were, as we saw, were, were restructuring and others were madly hiring depending upon their area. So the, the, the term of virtual notifications or virtual hiring I think most organizations have figured out very well. Um, and I think this goes back to ensuring that all your plan B contingencies are in place when you're looking at virtual notifications. It can absolutely be done in a very empathetic way. It's just realizing what your obstacles are, giving the employee as much support as possible. And I think a follow-up question they had was, you know, is there any emotional resiliency training? There is all sorts of, of, of resiliency training that a lot of uh, career transition providers will also have as part of their support to employees. So I think it's really trying to figure out where possible, how much support can you give to these departing employees? Because we've, we've figured out very well how to support them in a virtual environment. Thanks, Diane. There's another question here. I'm interested in hearing your perspectives rebuilding new teams post reorg commencement remotely. We are doing a lot large reorg and creating a new operating model. Challenge to get everyone together effectively on a Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. Great question. And uh, uh, I think some to, to some degree, people are getting a little Zoom fatigued after all of the uh, communication through this. So this is critical to rebuild because part of what happens post restructuring is there is some breakdown on trust in the organization. So finding ways to rebuild that trust is part of rebuilding those teams. 
So some of the best practices is actually finding ways to get people together. And so what we're seeing organizations do is a lot more uh, virtual team support. And that is creating some rules of the road. So rules of engagement, how are we gonna work together as a team? Putting that out on the table in terms of having conversations around how do we need to work together effectively uh, with changing roles or changing people on the team. There's rebuilding understanding and getting to know people. So what I'm seeing organizations doing is setting up either weekly or biweekly meetings that are just drop-ins, having a chance to connect uh, with individuals within that team just to have a uh, casual conversation. So we're seeing that happen. We're having drop-in meetings with leaders to say, Kim will be open from three to five on, on Jan February 25th. Please drop in if you have questions and you can have one-on-one -on -one with different leaders. But it's really about rebuilding the, the rules of engagement, rebuilding the, how you're going to work together and getting to know people as individuals and how communication is going to be handled. There isn't one medium that makes sense for everybody in terms of working together as a team, but really making sure you build in time to have one-on-ones with each person on the team, as well as team events uh, that they need to do. And they don't always need to be business-related team events. They can be social in terms of rebuilding some of those relationships. I'll just turn it over to you, Diane. Is there anything you'd like to add to that question? Uh, no, no, I don't think it's that question. No, thanks. I'm not sure uh, if I answered that question effectively, but definitely please add some additional components to that. Yeah, there's a, another question here I see, and it's, it's asking, um, you know, what are our thoughts on offering early retirement incentive plans or voluntary separation incentive plans as part of restructuring? And so, Kim, I'll ask for your thoughts in a second. My, my advice initially is that there's some caution involved that if you don't get the numbers you want when you're asking for a voluntary selection, is it immediately going to then have to be a forced separation? So there could be you know, immediate morale and productivity loss and, and angst with the organization if they think you're not going to get the numbers you want and it's just going to be the result of a forced termination anyways. So I, I offer, you know, a, a caution for people. Is this again going back to your business strategy? What would work well? Are there other options to offer employees and to really have that message out there clear so they understand? I don't know, Kim, if you want to add anything to that. Thanks, Diane. It's interesting. I recently was working with an oil and gas organization and they mm -hmm. offered an early retirement and they had overly resounding uh -huh. uh, sign up and actually had way more people sign up for it <laughs> than they even anticipated. And I think at the end of the day, this goes back to how are we treating those people that are taking early retirement and the financial incentive definitely uh, creates an incentive for people to participate in that. And again, part of that is your workforce. What is the demographic makeup of your workforce and your population? If you have a huge percentage that are retirement eligible, you, you'll have to evaluate how to make that fit because you may end up losing more people than you intended, intended to. But I do encourage you, if you're going to offer early retirement to people, think about the financial incentives. Think about the early uh, retirement planning support, whether it's financial support, whether it's retirement planning in terms of what are people actually going to do with their lives. Sometimes people won't take it if they don't actually have a vision of what retirement looks like for them. So sometimes offering some kind of retirement planning workshops or something to provide some insight that might help more people sign up. So sometimes you have a huge uh, amount of employees that sign up and some that actually don't sign up. So again, it depends on what you anticipate the, the challenges might be in that. But I think uh, early retirement, any kind of voluntary support always offers a bit of goodwill. Now, as Diane mentions, if you don't have enough sign up, you will obviously have to turn to uh, mandatory re uh, reduction in staff. So mm -hmm. I think you need to evaluate your employee workforce in terms of the demographics. What's your financial incentives? What are your workshops or uh, content that you're going to provide to help them make that decision? Sometimes people don't understand what, what their financials are to even make that decision. So any of that would be helpful mm -hmm. in terms of offering that. Yeah, that's great. Someone else had also asked about um, can these apply? Can this apply everything that we've talked about today to smaller organizations? And and this short answer is absolutely yes. We we do work um, you know with organizations of all sizes, you know small to to global size, 
And so, you know, all of these principles can be put into place, I think, regardless of the size of the organization. In the ideal scenario, because I'm just looking at another question here, you've got time to plan through this appropriately. But someone has also asked, what if we don't have this? What if we are under very tight timelines? That can be a struggle. And this is where you might want to consider, you know, an external advisory support, whether it's like a career transition firm to help actually help you through those planning uh, steps to make sure that you are covering off all of those contingency issues as, as much as possible. Great. So one of the questions here, you mentioned creating a balanced team to review current and future talent needs. Do you recommend mixed leadership levels or can you provide some best practices, examples on how to best achieve this? Who should have a seat at the table? Great question. Um, mixed leadership levels, I'm not sure I, I would go there, but I would say you obviously need your senior leadership group involved. But what I think from a mixed is important to me is representation for different components of your lines of business, but also what's really important on that mix is having representation from your talent development team around skill needs for the future or where potential gaps are, but also your talent acquisition saying, here's what I'm seeing and these are the roles that we're trying to fill. So really having a cross practice of people on the context of HR, as well as who's on the front side of building the strategy out so whoever's leading your strategy initiative needs to be part of the seat at the table. Anyone that's actually leading the workforce transformation needs to have a seat at the table. The only cautionary note I'd have about the different levels is are they senior enough um, to add to the conversation and are they going to be able to keep it confidential? So I think that would be my only cautionary note, but absolutely cross different divisions within the organization. Because as we all know, everybody brings a different lens to the dialogue. Uh, so cross across across the organization, but not necessarily deep, and across the HR uh, disciplines is what I would encourage you to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. We have a, another question here to asking about best practices for supporting remaining employees. Um, and, and, and this question is asking particularly for larger organizations, maybe when the morale is damaged. Um, so there's lots of things that we can do for remaining employees and to maybe circle back on onto one of our comments we talked about earlier, if there is a sound rationale that has been put out so employees can understand why, first of all, the restructuring had to take place, that goes a long way versus trying to make it seem a little um, you know, more shaded. It, have a clear understanding that you can relay to your employee population about what's happening and what the direction of the organization is to move forward. So that's one piece. You could also have resiliency training. There is change management. And then both Kim and I talked about the, the need for hyper-communication. Something that uh, we always stress when we're doing training is making sure that the managers are doing impromptu sessions, asking proactively, how are people doing, making sure that they don't assume after a week, everyone is fine, you know, everyone's going to move forward. Uh, that's not what happens. <laughs> you know, people grieve and people adjust to this news differently, and they have to understand what their role is going to be in the new organization. Any other thoughts, Kim? No, I think that, that you covered that well, um, in terms of addressing those concerns or questions. Um, what about the someone's asking about career transition services or, or outplacement services and and uh, definitely we would consider that one of the best practices that I might sound a little biased because obviously uh, LHH provides career transition services but I would say when you are selecting a career transition provider make sure it has the capabilities that you're looking for make sure if you're a global that has reach if you need office support make sure it's local making sure you understand their account management structure so they have somebody local to support you, making sure they have the resources to support the size and scope of your project, making sure they uh, have experience in your industry. Those are some of the things that I would suggest that you think about when you're selecting a career transition provider. Um, um, if I'm understanding that question, hopefully I've answered some of those things. Mm -hmm. And I think just, you know, in our current scenario, um, does the provider also have enough, uh, you know, resources to, to allow the individual to access all of the tools virtually? So, um, you know, do they have the capabilities for people to have, whether it's 
Zoom or WebEx meetings? Can they still have that ability? Do they have access to online tools and resources that are going to help them uh, move forward uh, in the, in the um, job search process? Thanks, Diane. Great. Are the restructuring fundamentals the same whether the organization is growing or downsizing? And uh, my first answer is yes. And what I mean by that is change can be good or change can be bad in people's eyes and perceptions. So any change requires people to be able to be resilient to the change. Um, if you think about the biggest change events in many people's lives, getting married, getting divorced is a positive and a negative. Having children is a positive, but it's still a major change. So thinking mm -hmm. about change of any scope, positive or negative, still requires the basic fundamentals of support around helping people see the value of the change, see the end goal in mind, being able to be resilient. I think if we look through this pandemic era, some of the biggest skills that have been identified as skills that we need every leader and individual have moving forward is leading and leading with empathy, leading with acknowledgement of, of the difficulties and making sure people are agile to respond to those change. We all have had change in our life that we can't control. So focusing on the things that we can control are still basic fundamentals that I would encourage every organization to think about. Communication is still king on any change, whether it's growth or downsizing. Everybody wants to understand the why Everybody wants to understand what's in it for me with that change, whether it's growth or downsizing. Everybody wants to know the implication of that and the why. Um, and those are things that need to still be communicated and communication will still be fundamental to any initiative related to, to growth or downsizing. Yeah. So we have another question here. What methodologies exist to continue progressive communication and positive leadership attitude uh, during a transition? So I think we've talked about a number of those, um, you know, areas. Um, you know, if, if the business strategy message has to be clear, the senior leaders have to um, believe in the message because they are going to be the face of it to their employees that they're working with. And, you know, as I commented just a, a few minutes ago, I think it's important for the leaders to really have um, driving that communication even stronger as we keep reiterated, hyper communicate. You've got to have those those departmental meetings, the larger communication meeting, those impromptu meetings, the employees have to understand where the organization is going um, in order to feel that they're gonna be part of this. Thanks, Diane. And I think we have time for maybe one more question because we're getting close to the top of the yeah. hour. Do you wanna pick one more question to respond to? Okay. One of the questions that, that often, and I'll let you answer this one, I get asked is around best practices. When you have multiple people being impacted, are you better to do it all in one day mm. or spread it over multiple days, like different mm. waves? So I'll let you answer that one, sure. Diane. And, and so it's a really, it, it depends answer. So sometimes what we have to work out with, uh, with organizations is you don't want in the best world to drag things out too long. But depending on the numbers of people, sometimes from a logistics standpoint, there are obstacles, whether it's time zones, geographical situations, or you might have a very small HR team that physically can only do so many um, notifications physically in one day. So I think a best practice is, is trying to get them done um, as quickly as possible, but still without feeling that you are cheating the employees out of their, their conversations. No one's feeling too rushed because what you want to then move on to is with that remaining group of employees and helping them understand the why it's happened and uh, where the organization is moving next. So it is a bit of an it depends answer, depending on a number of logistics and what your internal resources are. Thanks, Diane. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for all the fantastic questions that were asked. Diane, my uh, emails are on the screen. If you wanna just take a screenshot of that, if you wanna reach out with any additional questions, we'd be happy uh, to answer any additional questions. And I think Laura Samaro my comment, I think there'll be a recording shared from this webinar today that you each will have a copy of. It'll be sent out to you 
uh, in Europe for attending the, the seminar. Laura, do you want to comment on that? Or Samara? A recording will be shared with everyone, yes. Great. Thanks, Laura. Beautiful. Thanks very again for everybody attending and your uh, great questions. Uh, look forward to further dialogue if you reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you.